Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 287. That's dos ocho siete. Dos ocho siete. Welcome. How are you doing? Great. Amazing. Happy you're doing well. Happy you're doing fine. As per usual, I'm here in a hot seat somewhere in the depths of East London, talking to you live and direct from YouTube, also streaming from to you live and direct from your Apple um, listening device, your Android listening device, and other, any other Android or any other listening device you have that plays podcasts, right? For the most part. Hope you good. Hope you well. Good. Great. Amazing. How am I doing? I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. It's a rainy day today. It's absolutely pelting it down. Um, it's wet. It's, dr- it's wet. It's muggy. It's, um, um, it's cold. It's everything that you would expect from a very lovely midweek day during, you know, London's wintry spell. But you know what? We keep on trucking on. As per usual, if you listen to this podcast via the podcast app, please like and share leave me a five star review so people can find the show if you're watching this via youtube right now hi how you doing please smash that like button click subscribe leave me a comment and let me know what you think of the show yeah cool bless as per usual i go through all of the major streetwear news of the week of the past months of the past days of the last 24 hours and also sprinkle in some other little you know everyday con- current cultural stuff that i think is of relevance that i think my audience are gonna like i share it on this podcast i upload it on a regular basis on a weekly basis mostly i try to do a minimum of two uploads a week and sometimes at the max where i'm really going for it, i'm really trying to push that algorithm in my favor i try and do five but we're gonna sit here live in the record and just talk about stuff and get in on it right cool so um my plans how am i doing i'm feeling pretty good i'm pretty pretty fine i've got a holiday booked next week actually i'm going to um but what am i going i'm going to birmingham i know a lot of people don't have a, a lot of good things to say about birmingham birmingham doesn't really get a bit of a good rep in london or in the uk for the most part. people have a lot of negative things to say about it say it's boring say it's nothing to do but you know what i want to have a little bit of a break unplug from the whole london lifestyle um unwind slower 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 pace is it the pace slower, do you think, over there or not? I don't know. I don't think it's slower. Is it slower? It might be slower. Birmingham's pretty hustly, bustly kind of city as well, isn't it, right? Um, there's a few clubs there. There's a few concert halls there or arenas. So I'm pretty sure. And there's a massive fucking um, shopping center. So it might not be the most slowest place in the world, but it's pretty sure going to be a lot more slower than, you know, Oxford Circus in peak hours. So that should be good. And then that's about it, really. And then for the next, rest, rest of the March, I'm chilling out. And then going to Berlin, I think, at the end of April, right, for the May Day's festivity. So I think between <coughs> between that holiday in March and between the end of April, I'm going to be pretty strict and pretty kind of keeping my head down, working out and doing a damn thing and not kind of messing about in it. Because you know why? This part of the month is the best, best part of the year is the best time to kind of, you know, unwind, get yourself acquainted with stuff and just not fuck around with things. So that's what I'm kind of doing at the moment. Um, so what is what to be said this week? Um, oh yeah. And DJing is what happened to be DJing. I think at the end of the month too, that should be good. And that's about it really, isn't it? DJing stuff, the DJing gigs for the most part have sort of slowed down this time of year. I'm not sure if it's because it's the time of the year or because I haven't been hustling as much. Whereas, you know what? I know what it is. I haven't been hustling as much. I haven't been really um thrown out because i would always kind of send out loads of random kind of you know um unsolicited emails and stuff to bar managers and event programmers and you know promoters and stuff to try and get myself on a lineup for a gig but at the moment that's sort of slowing down um and again um, there is a part of me that's sort of like i need to do everything in it mostly sort of like entrepreneurial things that you do outside of work they unfortunately require you to do just everything everything it requires for you to get over the line of you to get your kind of look in and to kind of get a foot in the door so i have to kind of do more mixes online or um, uh, do more recorded dj mixes and, re- and, re- and upload them online sir to my soundcloud and stuff i need to do more live stream video footage of me maybe on facebook or some clips i can upload onto my instagram And I also need to be sending out loads of emails and demo mixes to people that I think would be a good fit for the stuff that I'm doing. I just need to do more of it. There's no excuse. I can't do... um, Yeah, I just have to do everything at the same time. But it's, you know, it takes a lot of time to do it. Plus, you know, with a full-time job, plus trying to record a podcast every week, plus trying to run and work out. There isn't that much time in a day left to do it. Well, there is time, but I have to make that decision where I decide to go pro. I think there's a book here about it somewhere. Is it? Have I got it there? Nope, probably moved it. But... It's a really amazing book um, by Stephen Pressfield about going pro, right? About the art of whatever that, that I've read a few times. That is a very good book. Um, 
But yeah, I have to decide to kind of make that decision. Because once you make that decision, um, you just have to kind of prioritize um, your creative endeavors. And you basically can't do anything else outside of it. You can't really afford to sit down and binge watch Narcos. You can't really afford to go out with your friends for the most part, unless it's like an industry networking event. Um, there is no going out. There is no watching of series. Even football, for the most part, I've missed quite a few matches. I've had to like download them. Like even the other day, I missed uh, Man United v Everton, so I had to kind of download the match on my MacBook and then kind of watch it um, as I went to um, Berlin. Or oh, no, it was the game before that. It might have been the game against Wolves. I had to download one of those games anyway in full. And nowadays it's pretty cool because you can just download a, a, a football match um you know first half second half and sort of like watch it at your own leisure which is a bit of a psycho thing i think i think some people have a bit of a weird feeling when it comes to watching re-watching uh live ev sporting events right and a lot of commentators do it I, I, I know i've heard joe rogan say a lot of times when he's been announcing the ufc that the next day he might just sit down and re-watch some things right just to kind of get an idea on what's actually happened and what was the deal of it but i don't know man it's quite hard to do but Again, it just it's, these are all a, a, a consequence of like, for once in my life, I'm actually doing the things I should be doing, right? Outside of work. in At work, it's not, you know, again, it's not probably the best situation at the moment. But I think outside of work, I've done everything I can do to kind of push things forward. I've been trying to post more social because I had this weird period in my time in my life where I was like against promoting myself on social media. But I really have to kind of differentiate myself on that platform to make people know that, you know, I'm not just a consumer of things. I am a doer. I am actually making things on my own. I am actually pushing content forward. I'm talking about interesting topics and stuff. And, you know, the more I do that, the hopefully the more it reaches the bigger audience. People get to see it. And I just become a voice in the community in it. I'm not really bothered about the money thing or about fame thing. I just want to become one of the people that people go to when they want to hear certain things about what's happening in, in the scene, in the culture. And hopefully, um, upload by upload, that will happen. Um, so enough rambling from me let's get into some topics i've got some bare stuff to talk about loads of good news loads of interesting bits and bobs to get into so let's just like dive right on deep and just start analyzing what's happening in the culture because there's so many things going on so number one i want to open it up with just some pure excellence um killing mbappe scored a goal against um olympic Lyon. i think for a cup i think it might be the french cup the other day an incredible run that um i don't know you, you know like um you don't really get the... I think sports is one of those things where, like... Like most things, I think, in life, isn't it, right? You you don't appreciate fashion until you, you someone actually someone actually asks you to, like, I don't know, to pattern cut, right? Or to make a dress. Or even just to kind of put together a curtain, right? It's those kind of difficult things. You don't really realise how, how hard they are until you have to do it. Or when you have to go to, like, a life drawing class and you all suddenly get... It's funny when you go to a life drawing class that you get more self-conscious about your ability to write than the person that's standing in front of you stark naked, isn't it? Really. After like, the first five minutes, oh, look, that person's like, really, oh, she's got boobs. You know what I mean, that kind of wears off. And then suddenly you start to become self-conscious about your ability to draw and you start to hide it. And then you, there's always somebody in your class. I'd never not been to a life drawing class where there's not one fucking, you know, Pablo Picasso to your right, just absolutely slaying it, right? Just drawing freehand closing his eyes while smoking a zoo and just fucking smashing it and you're like look at my thing it looks like a stick man um so i think football and sports are football football specifically is one of the things where like you know i've played football for most of my life it was the first sport i kind of got into competitively i played it to a pretty decent level uk standards considering like you know i'm pretty sure if i went to the states i'd probably be semi-professional so i'm i'm pretty good at it right but when you watch football, especially on a professional level, no matter how much stick you might give some people in your team who you think are crap, you're still very aware that these guys are at the top apex, right? They're like the 0.01% of athletes who have been able to kind of break through, especially in the UK where like everyone plays football. Same, I guess it'll be the same in America, right? With basketball. Everyone plays basketball. So it's probably a lot harder to make it in America as a basketball player than it would be anywhere else. And it also means that if you do make it, you are really, really, really good. Um, you know, uh, put, put aside your height, you know, put aside like your physical attributes that might kind of, you know, um, give a bit of an advantage. When it comes to pure skill, you have to be really good at it. So I like that this clip kind of illustrates just how far up the levels Kylian Mbappe is. I think he's like, what, 21 or 20 or something, right? It, ridiculously young how old he is. And considering as well, footballers get, you know, they he, especially his peak as a striker will come much later in his career, especially if he keeps himself in top physical condition. And he's able to kind of transition from like the player he is now with all 
because I'd I love to see what Kylian Mbappe would is going to look like once he gets a bit older once his pace is not there as much as it was now he hasn't got that electrifying kind of burst of pace because like, I remember Van Persie was the same right then he got a few injuries and his pace kind of left him so then he had to kind of adapt to his game and kind of change the way he plays and become like the quintessential number nine right scoring tap-ins uh, scoring goals inside the inside the box loads of more headers um, I'd love to see what he kind of develops into going forward because I think that's what Samuel Eto'o was able to do too because I kind of think they have the same sort of like gangly kind of striking um um uh, kind of uh, way of playing in that respect right they're always kind of pulling out to the flanks driving on e dri driving on in the inside confusing defenders with their runs um of course electrifying pace from start to finish i still remember that um some sammy otto goal he scored for real batiste against real madrid that time like just incredible thing but just look at this kind of goal from Kylian mbappe and just uh, marvel at the fucking pure brilliance of the man right that he's able to kind of do such a thing um at this such high level right it's just incredible to watch really to be honest um see if i can get up on here so it's the video right He's running from the from from inside his area, so he kind of so again describing it from people who listen to the podcast. He picks it up well within his area, probably say I don't know three quarters of the way inside his own area. He turns, faces the defender, gives him a step over, which is not even really a step over. It's more so like just like a feint, just to kind of give himself the ability to kind of push the ball forward and essentially just run past the defender who tries to put his elbow out to actually block him like he wants to actually just just to take him out because he knows if he and as soon as Kylian Mbappe pushes that ball past him he's off and he's, he's, uh, he's away and that was one of the things I hated about because I remember when I was younger I used to be a winger so sometimes there'll be occasions where I would have to play right back to kind of cover somebody or maybe someone got sent off or whatever right the first option for you to kind of cover the wing backs because the wing back I think is one of the roles is one of the positions that no one really wants to play people don't mind playing as a winger because I guess you've got the ability to stand on the, on the wing go up and down for the most part just go up and not really defend Central midfield is a bit more of a exposing place too because you know everyone can see when you're tracking back or marking your man or filling the spaces and center back you know you don't really want to be there because if you get skinned the person's through on goal so wing back is one of those positions where it looks appealing but it's obviously it's, it's also very very evident and very very um you can obviously tell when you're getting absolutely ripped to pieces so i never wanted to play there but the times I did play there, the, the times that you felt like you were going to die was when you were playing against a winger that was an actual winger that could actually just push it past and just run. And it always made you look fucking horrible because by the time you got up to... Because there'll be two or three occasions you might get up and recover, right? And smash the ball out to the stands. But as you're getting up, you're like... <gasps> It took everything out of you to do that. So he's well aware of it. He's like, oh, okay. Because he does this every day, right? This is his, this is his bread and butter, running up and down that line. So for you, he, he, he notices it. I, I'm sure similar to like a, I guess it's similar to like a fight, right? The fighter, once you're kind of tied up, you can kind of feel your body, feel your heart rate, feel how you're breathing. Um, and you can kind of see the kind of fight dying out of you. And then from there, he knows how when to turn on the pace and when not to. Same with being a fullback, right? And playing against a really good winger. He can see it in your eyes and you're gone. And I guess this is a good indication of it. I'm pretty sure after this occasion, when Kylian Mbappe ran into that defender again, he just probably, you know, retreated and ran away. But it's, just, it's an amazing run, man. He just pushes the ball past the defender here over the halfway line. Now he's facing up to two defenders. He's got one on the inside. And he does the fake. My favorite, this is one of my favorite moves in football. And I think Wayne Rooney used to do it quite a lot towards the end of his career. The kind of run where you're driving in from the left-hand side, driving diagonally into the box. And then you sort of like push it to your right hand side of your foot as if you're going to shoot and you kind of flick it on the inside, which makes the defender usually uh, get wrong foot with a golf balance. And then you kind of strike it either with your left foot to the opposite corner or you poke it with your right foot, which I'm kidding about end up doing here. It's just one of my favorite moves in football, man. So, so easy, but so, so effective. Boom, chops in, bang. It flies past the defender, goalkeeper in the flash. And I think that's, that's the thing that I've noticed quite often with them. Um, professional football players yes the decision making is impeccable right they always seem to know when to make the right pass they always let go of the ball just when it should be like that's the thing you see a difference when you go to watch like sunday league or saturday league football you see a lot of good players but they don't necessarily know when to make the right choice and because they don't make the right choice the person i guess the ball next doesn't make the right choice and they kind of you know it's a kind of domino effect and i also notice too whenever it comes to shooting they take too long like there's too many touches like everything's like one everything's just setting up setting up setting up setting up and then hitting it sometimes it doesn't matter because you know no one's going to catch you if you're really quick in the Saturday league football and you're in the box already you might end up scoring but i think in top level football you just can't do that because everyone's really good like right the goalkeepers are some of the best in the world they'll come out running and take out your legs defenders are really defenders really enjoy defending so they will take joy out of smashing you to pieces so you have to really 
once you get into the area like every no actually even the ball coming to you towards the area is set up in a way where it can come across your body you can open yourself up or you already have a vision of where the butt where the flipping goal is and you can just lace it into the direction that you want to hit it in so you're not even taking a touch so the defender hasn't got time to even pick up and get the ball to you because once you take a touch and you kind of stumble your feet to kind of get onto it the defender's got time to make up the space and then the chance is already gone but i think that's one thing you see quite often with top players they just they just it's it's all it's all like it's all like um you know, it reminds me of, it reminds me of like American football drills. It's all kind of premeditated. It's all stuff you've been kind of drilling in a training ground. Like that's what Ronaldo used to do with his step overs. Like boom, 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 boom. One, two, three, boom. To the left, push it out, bang, shoot. It's something that you do consistently all the time. It's sort of like the um, Iron Robin uh, cutting into his left foot and then bending it to the opposite corner. It's the same move every time as, you know, um, what's his face said um, about, uh, you know, what's his name? The fighter, well, I've got the name uh, he said about it, right? Same move every time, but it works really, really well. Look at that. Boom. Bang. Straight in the bottom corner. So yeah. Terrific thing to see from there. Um yeah, what a what a great um what a great entry there from uh, the old Killian Mbapp or Bap and Killian, however however you want to prefer to him. So let's move on. Next we've got here some a great story about Twitter. Twitter are launching a new feature which I think has only been announced just today. Maybe just say it, let's see. But um, new feature actually uh, launched yesterday. Uh, they're launching a new feature called Instagram. Well, copying the Instagram Stories method. And I'm pretty sure you guys are aware that Instagram Story copied that thingy feature off of Snapchat. It's the kind of thing that happens a lot in startups, and people don't really mind it. I guess in any, any other industry, kind of plagiarism on that kind of level will get called out. It'll be a shame. It'll be something that you'd be ashamed of doing. You wouldn't want to be caught doing it. But in startup world, whatever your competitor is doing that works. Your investors kind of, you know, caught. Uh, your investors are basically would argue. Your investors argue. Yeah, your investors will basically argue that it was imperative for you to do the same thing. You have to kind of, um, you have to do it because they think that you know they don't want their competitors to steal a march on them. And if the investors are all about making sure they get the best returns on their money, then you as a founder, you have to kind of acquiesce with it. And also, maybe another part of it too, there is a side of it where startup brands are sort of startup companies are sort of like, look. There is no one um, all-knowing, all-powerful kind of, you know, startup or service or product out there that's going to dominate everything, maybe unless you're kind of Google search. No one's really done that. For the most part, there's always kind of every, there's an alternative for everything. So maybe some startup founders are like of the thinking of like, you know what, we're all kind of contributing to this kind of greater goal of, I don't know, lowering emissions or getting more people on electric vehicles. So it doesn't matter if I copy your feature or if I copy your kind of style of bikes or style of scooters as long as we're getting everyone out of you know um kind of you know um carbon emission carbon emissioning cars and all that sort of shit and again on scooters it's all well and good so maybe that's part of it but i also think in general it's just a way for them to kind of you know because because you know innovation so hard to come by especially nowadays um, to kind of iterate those ideas to kind of get them out in the right manner and to also kind of hope it works because you know no one wants to end up with like you know what's that what's that google social media platform no one wants to end up like that right no one wants to end up wasting money on engineers and time putting a putting some product out that no one really fucking cares about so if you can kind of co-opt the product that's already working and make it work within your infrastructure then so be it and of course twitter in the last few years has kind of seen a bit of resurgence you could say it was part of, partly the donald trump effect right I'm sure Jack Dorsey maybe behind closed doors would be, you know, as much as he kind of derides or he kind of is a bit annoyed that, you know, essentially Trump has, in one way, I think I remember Joe Rogan saying like Trump is basically, when Trump got elected, he basically gave reason or basically gave carte blanche to like douchebags to be absolutely douchebags, right? Because he's the ultimate kind of, I don't give a shit about what everyone thinks about me. I can, I'm just going to do and say what I want. So you kind of gave people that an excuse. So maybe if you're Jack Dorsey, you're like, ah, oh, he kind of maybe legitimized people being mean and just being, you know, um, yeah, just being mean and overly, overly combative on Twitter in some respects, which is not, maybe not true because it was a thing that happening for a long time. But you know, on the other side too, he's also maybe thankful for Donald Trump because he was able to breathe new life into a platform that was by all means or by all indication, if you judge, if you believe what the critics and the kind of media analysts and all the commentators say, it was basically dying and on its kind of last legs. And he kind of gave it a bit more of a legitimate voice. It's, part, it's basically the only platform where you can do these kind of weird, weird mini blogs kind of entries and get your thoughts out there in written form. Of course, it's not the best place to kind of deep into some dive, deep into some uh, complex issues and stories, but you've seen loads of really interesting things pop up from there from that woman. Remember that girl that had that story about 
being a stripper or being an escort or something. She, her story got bought. Uh, someone bought the rights to it and now they're developing into a film. People have been able to, essentially the Me Too movement brought down one of the most powerful men in Hollywood at the time and Harvey Weinstein. Loads of amazing things have kind of emanated from Twitter and you can kind of, in some ways you can say there was a post Trump phase in Twitter and there was a uh, sorry there's a pre Trump phase and there was a post Trump phase in Twitter and now they're obviously evolving and trying to grow it as they can and this new feature that's been kind of put out there by somebody that's I think part of the Twitter team it looks like it's a very interesting feature and something that I think will work pretty well like a stories feature that will work well on Twitter so this is a tweet from a guy called uh, Kai Von Bakerpore he's a product leader at Twitter and a co-founder of Periscope so obviously somebody that's um, very much into that's very much a part of the Twitter infrastructure and will know what's actually going on so he kind of announces the other day and all the blogs are picking up so it says it's the following it's the tweet I'm going to read out to you and you can see it on the screen hopefully if you're watching this via the YouTubes okay so this is the following um everyday people come to twitter to see what's happening one of the unique things about twitter is that what's happening is fueled by people sharing their thoughts openly through uh through tweets but sharing your thoughts publicly can be intimidating which is very true i think a lot of people have said i think he's taking oh i think he's got a quote there because i think there is a common thing in twitter land where people are like very much against sharing you no know, where people i didn't know there was a thing but people always say that they have loads of stuff in their drafts that they would never post because sometimes it's like you know you might be drunk or it might be a thought that you might think might be a bit problematic. It might be some, something in general that you're not really well informed about. So it's kind of like fleeting, kind of like, you know, ignorant tweets, so quote unquote. You probably kind of leave them to one side and you kind of go for the low brow, you know, you know, little meme, little joke here and there, the little LOL moment and just keep it moving. The tweet continues here. Um, duh, 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 duh. People often tell us that uh, people often tell us that they don't feel comfortable tweeting because tweets can be seen and replied to by anybody. Feel permanent and performative. How many likes and retweets will this get? Many of us can probably emphasize this, which is true because I think that was part of the reason why people were very much uh, um, pushing them to get an edit button for spell checks. But I think Jack Dorsey is very much against it. I'm not really sure what the reason was behind it, but obviously, I guess in some respects part of the appeal of twitter part of what's kind of made it popular is the fact that some people have been able to get cancelled right because of saying the wrong thing or tweeting out the wrong thing or making the wrong response so the idea that someone can continually keep editing their tweets might not be the best way to go about it maybe they could introduce some sort of timer where you can only edit your tweet within the first 30 minutes or five minutes of you putting out the tweet a timer starts ticking down and after that you can't really um edit it because the thing in the world about the internet, even if you put out a, a dumb tweet that doesn't really resonate with people, it's not as if you deleting it is ever going to you know, make sure it's gone forever. People are gonna, still going to take a screenshot of it and just save it into their document. So it's not as if your tweet kind of disappears. So the edit function would still work in that respect, even if they had an option where you could edit it, you know, the bo up button at the bottom where, you know how you say view hidden replies? You could click that button and it could, it could show you all the edits that have been done prior to what you're seeing there. It will say, oh, this, this, this tweet has four edits. You click it and it shows you all the edits I've kind of gone through. Maybe that's the thing. But anyway, continues here. Um, next tweet here says the following. We've been listening to this feedback and working on creating to create new capabilities that address some of the anxieties that hold people back from talking on Twitter. Um, so I'm assuming they're trying to drive engagement as well. This is part of the product feature in it. Um, today in Brazil only, we're starting a test on Android and iOS for one of those new capabilities. It's called Twitter Fleets. Let's start this video again. So you've got, you got somebody tweeting here on Twitter, um, in Portuguese, of course. Oh no, saying on, no, this is, this is an iMessage, oh no, is it a DM? It's a DM, right? Somebody DMing people. And then on top of it, on the DMs, you've got people's circles, like similar like Instagram stories where you can kind of click, I'm assuming, on their profile picture and it'll bring up a screen similar to Instagram stories where you can see their tweet stories. Click it, boom, it comes up. And then you can tweet a kind of, you know, a non a nondescript tweet that you don't really want to put on your own timeline. And it goes up on your story, I'm assuming, right? There's another tweet she puts up there again. You put a bit of media on it. Oh, wow, you can put a little thing on it. So it's basically, it's basically like Instagram stories. Completely. That's a really clever idea. I love it. So you continue here. Uh, fleets are a way to share fleeting thoughts. Unlike tweets, fleets uh, disappear after 24 hours and don't get retweets, likes, or public re replies. People can only react to fleets via DMs. Instead of showing up in people's head head headlines, timelines, sorry, fleets are viewed by tapping your avatar. That's perfect. Uh, first of all, I love the name. Whoever come up with a name in-house, like, congratulations to you. 
tweets and fleets is fucking incredible. I think that's going to be something that's going to be part of our everyday lexicon, right? How tweets have become part of our everyday kind of conversation, right? Um, I think fleets is going to enter, 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 be reintroduced into the conversation too. I like the idea that you can only reply to via DM, send it to Instagram stories, so you don't have the idea of it kind of clogging up your main feed. And just the idea that it's a 24 hour only thing. You just kind of post out there in the moment and kind of get it going. Of course, this is going to encourage celebrities to kind of, you know, say the most wildest shit on Twitter. Maybe that'll be an interesting thing. Maybe Instagram would now end up being like, you know how people do that meme where it's like, how you are on Instagram, how you are on Facebook, how you are on LinkedIn, how you are on Twitter. That might be a thing where you might be a little bit more ratchet on your in Twitter fleets than you would be on your Instagram stories. That would be pretty cool, isn't it? Like, you'll be like, you just say the most wildest shit on Twitter because you know it can go away in 24 hours and you know, you know, you might not have the same amount of followers on Twitter you do on Instagram. Because I think for the most part, unless you're, I don't know, I guess unless you're like Kylie or somebody, it feels like most people have a lot more followers most people have the their most followers they have are mostly on instagram right because i guess the idea because you know it's pictures and shit and if you're a girl you can essentially get your, your engagement is probably a lot higher on instagram i'm assuming than twitter maybe i don't know so maybe again that will probably lend itself to it, this idea that your twitter is sort of like your your kind of stories for instagram in that respect um here's some screenshots as well we can see of the actual app working fleets because you got twitter screen you pop over there with a button it flows up with it again with a box to write in and i think it's pretty cool um it continues here again i know what you're thinking that sounds a lot like stories yes there are many similarities with stories format that will feel familiar to people there are also a few intentional differences to make the experience more focused on sharing and saving people's thoughts yeah but it's still stories which doesn't matter i don't really care okay so you can scan through it like that that's interesting isn't it so you go to someone's stories and you click it and then you kind of you scan through it like instead of on Instagram, you know how you scan through it like left to right, and this you kind of scroll up and down like you would do on your Twitter feed or your Instagram main feed. So that's that's a pretty cool feature on it in general. And you can kind of like it, I guess, little button there underneath you can kind of like the thing, and I'm sure they get that through on their DM like you would do on other things. And you know, also it does. Maybe because these are all kind of clever starts are really clever in the idea that they introduce product usually to kind of drive engagement. So maybe it's a cool idea to kind of get people to kind of do these Instagram, sorry, these Twitter fleets, post, their, post them up on their stories. Then it also gets people to kind of react to these thing fleets and it goes directly to a DM, which gets people to go into their DMs more because maybe there is an understanding that people don't go in their DMs more often than not. So they want to probably drive the DM engagement up a little bit more, which is obviously going to happen with this sort of thing. Um, and yeah, in general, I think there's going to be a lot of fun to be had for it in general going forward. Uh, more tweets here. We're hoping that fleets can help people share the, the fleeting thoughts that uh, that would be unlikely to tweet. This is a sustainable change for Twitter, so we're excited to learn by testing it, starting with what today in Brazil and seeing how our customers use it. That is honestly really, really cool. I love the idea, man. I think it's going to work out really well. I think we're going to see a lot more engagement on Twitter with it. And I think, again, it's just a it's a great... I, lo I just love to see how, they re how they've been reacting to things. You know, the increase in the kind of... Uh, the character count on your tweets was a really good introduction, I thought, by Twitter. And the idea that they just kind of... They really got into the weeds of stuff and really tried to make sure that they kind of are... Uh, testing and implementing new features just to kind of keep the app, the app fresh and i've also noticed that people are kind of you know doing a lot on there so why not kind of engage them a lot more and kind of give them a reason to do it more and this idea that people have different sort of personas different platforms is really helpful for twitter because i think we're, we're kind of reached past the stage because everyone always says oh what's on this instagram it's gonna kill instagram i don't think that's gonna happen i think we've reached a stage where now there's going to be other platforms coming out like tiktok for instance that call for a certain type of media, a certain type of creative output, a certain type of approach, but there's not gonna be something that's gonna take over like before, oh, this thing killed that, that thing killed that. I don't think we're in that platform anymore. I think people are more than happy to have different um, user profiles on different platforms that do different things, right? So I'm sure if you go on someone's TikTok that you're following on Instagram, they have completely different content on there. For if the ones that are doing it well anyway, you should have bespoke content for each platform. You shouldn't be trying to, you know, just copy and pasting your stuff on there, which is why I get annoyed at people that used to just copy and paste their fucking tweets onto fucking Instagram. It's super annoying. But nowadays people don't do that. Nowadays people just write on their Instagram stories and share it. Oh yeah, that's also a thing as well, isn't it? People do that quite often. People share... I do that myself i'll make like a massive comment about something and i'll share it on my instagram stories um with an image on it so yeah that might be part of the reason why as well okay cool these guys well it proves that how smart these guys are anyway because they're already thinking about these things way ahead of us anyway so um definitely t keep an eye out for that one launching in brazil now as a kind of trial period and i'm sure we're going to see it kind of roll out 
later on when everyone else gets wind of it and is like, oh my god, I want that, and then they're gonna obviously do that. Um, so um, jumping on into the next topic here, we've got some story about the coronavirus affecting DJs. This is from a DJ called uh, Post Human who kind of tweets some really amazing stuff about just in general about the industry and advice for up and coming starts up and coming DJs who will kind of want to get into the industry tricks of the trade um, some stuff that you should know about loads of gems he's a really solid dude and he's always kind of free with the information and he kind of got talking about something that I kind of never thought about you know when it comes to electronic music and the coronavirus as you guys are aware there's a global is it, is it pandemic or epidemic now at the moment with the coronavirus a virus that kind of originated from a, a region in China called Wuhan that's now been spread across parts of Europe parts of North America, parts of um, England as well. Um, for some reason, it hasn't touched Africa at all, which kind of led people to cons- have a conspiracy theory that black people are immune to coronavirus. But in general, it's a virus that's kind of wreaked havoc and really kind of um, made... I think people who weren't aware of how globally connected we were as a world be aware of it, right? Um, it's affected parts of the industry that you wouldn't really think they would be affected. Um, and obviously, you know, big events where gatherings of people are kind of join up and celebrate things are really being called into question. I, I remember reading a story about an Italian school or Italy in general, considering closing some of their schools down for two weeks of precautionary measure. Loads of things are happening to kind of make sure that this thing doesn't get as worse as it is. And obviously, um, a big part of it has been affected at the time now is festivals. <coughs> as I'm sure most of you are aware, festivals in the last few years have kind of sprung up all over the world. Festivals now are starting a lot sooner than they would have done maybe in, in years or decades gone by. So it feels as if now, I think a lot of these have said before in the past, I think Posthuman might have mentioned it too, that festivals, even though they're annoying, even though they might be not the most uh, creatively fulfilling place to be to, even though they might have, I don't know, um, an abundance of people who don't necessarily give a shit who you are as an artist, and it might be a bit of a cash grab, it still represents probably the best opportunity for a DJ to kind of earn the main chunk of their kind of take-home money or salary or kind of income would come from a festival I, i'd kind of uh, relate it a little bit to like i remember saying someone saying the same thing to me about in fashion supposedly there is this thing which i'm aware of from somebody who was in the industry i'm not sure if it's true maybe they were lying to me but supposedly a lot of the really high flying photographers in fashion some of the kind of biggest names that we know out there um most of them make their actual big money or the actual big coins on doing campaigns for like h&m or like i don't know boohoo or like fashion nova but just doing it on like a on like a need to know kind of like non credited uh, underground basis. So they'll do the photography campaign. They won't tell anybody it was them. It won't be on their CV or anything. But then they'll reach, they'll get a lot of money for it, and then that will then allow them to then go and do a campaign for Arena Plus Home, a campaign for Vogue Britain, for Vogue US, uh, ID Magazine, Days of Confused. They can do all those kind of really kind of um, uh, or even campaigns for brands. That would kind of pay for them them doing their mostly artistic stuff that's so i'd imagine festivals are maybe the same sort of thing for djs where they go to play at coachella or they go play in glastonbury to make the big bucks that then allows them to go play in some kind of shoddy bar somewhere in the middle of ukraine but it's got like a really good vibe it's got cool promoters a good crowd um that sort of thing so posthuman sort of spoke about it a little bit and i thought there's some interesting points here that he laid out that i want to quickly comment on First tweets here, it says the following. A major issue will be, um, so if someone put, post, posted here, Andrew Rice, I think he's one of the uh, writers for RA, I'm assuming, right? Yep, North America resident advisor, um, artist said, not sure we collectively realise how bad this affects the dance music industry. Um, coronavirus, I'm assuming again. If there's so much disruption at such an early stage, it could get a lot worse. A chance for club scenes to focus on local DJs on, on the one hand, but bad news for 20 which is very true. I think the same sort of thing is happening. Same, I've had the same sort of inkling or feeling when it comes to this new uh regulations or yeah regulations that have come into place with uh britain uh pulling out of the eu with, Bre- with brexit being fully enforced that you know um most DJs are going to require a visa to come and perform in the uk of course for more touring djs i think you have to be fair in the uh, um with their feelings or with their kind of disappointment that a lot of their main chunk of their money that they make in a year does come from them touring i'd imagine so i think it works the same way in comedy in most things anyway right you get the most amount of money from going on tour going on the road because for the most part the place that you're going to don't necessarily see somebody of your talent level going there a lot they want to pay a premium to get you and secure your services and you can essentially kind of bang out loads more of those kind of sets or those gigs in a short period of time back to back and then come back and sort of like, you know, do the local scene just to kind of keep yourself tied over. But a main chunk of your money has already been done that way. So it's a really cool way to kind of earn a living, right? You can kind of go out, make, um, go on the road for two months, come back home and you're basically sorted. Um, but then I thought, 
the Brexit thing will be a good thing for local dealers because it means that there won't be as much competition, I guess, with European or touring world acts. So it would mean that promoters will have to be a little bit more because promoters in general don't want to spend any more money than they're already spending, right? Hiring the venue, security, door, especially in the UK, there's so many costs that go into running a night, especially if it's not in like a, especially if it's not in a ready-made club space already, especially if it's something that you're putting on yourself. Like I can only imagine what it must cost for Boiler Room to keep putting on their shows, you know, week in, week out, especially in London. It's, it's insane, which I think is why they've got that building that they've kind of rented that kind of turned into the kind of London HQ um, because renting out these kind of cool, interesting spaces all over London just takes too much time and money to do, especially the right way. So I think what it would do is encourage local promoters who are, you know, not necessarily, I guess local promoters in some way, shape or form, can sometimes be the enemy and sometimes the, um, you know, the godsend, the angel for the scene. Because on one side, they could always keep pushing touring acts because they want to make money and they don't want to lose money on their acts, on their fucking promoting night, on their club night, sorry. They want to guarantee they get a certain amount of people through the door, so tickets or merch, whatever it may be. But on the other side as well, it could also push local DJs to kind of go out there and make their own club nights kind of sprung up in and around it, right? I think that might be kind of, kind of the tension that's happening. So with less competition, more local DJs can kind of spring up because they don't want to lose money, so just kind of hire them in general. But it also could affect the qu overall quality of the nights in London because it could mean that loads of local crappy DJs who, not, who have no right being on the stage in those kind of clubs are playing, which kind of leads to an overall bad product. Because I think, in my opinion, I've got always got the assumption that, you know, iron sharpens iron, right? You want to be in the scene. Like, you want to you wanna try and make as a DJ in Berlin. You want to try and make as a DJ, as a comedian in LA or New York because that's where all the best comedians are, right? You want to go where the best comedians are, you want to go where the best artists are, and you want to try and cut your teeth in that kind of shark-infested water and see if you sink or swim. That's just to kind of learn whether or not you're good enough and to also kind of make sure your learning curve is full. You know what I mean? It's super steep. So that's kind of one of the issues. But again, um, it might be a, a good kind of unintended consequences that, you know, some of our more smaller towns and cities in the UK are able to kind of shine a light back onto some local talent and they're able to kind of, you know, step up to a plate and make sure that the scene kind of continues on. But again, you know, it's only clubs, it's only club night, it's only going out, it's, there's bigger problems out there, but, you know, as a way to kind of deal with it, it might be an initial way to kind of address it. So Andrew Rice says, we're not sure we we'll collectively realise how bad the effects of the dance music industry could be. Again, if there's no such disruption as such an early, if there's so much disruption as the early stage, it's very true, it could get worse. A chance of club scene to focus on local leaders on the one hand, the bad is the Tory, cool. And posthumous is the following. A major issue will be uh, people simply staying at home, declining ticket sales, uh, even for events that still do run, which is very true. Yeah, going to public transport or going to a supermarket is still probably as dangerous as nightclub. And I noticed this when I went to Bergheim the other day, right? Um, I went to Bergheim last week, and I'm pretty sure it was a lot more empty than I remember it to be. I went right to the front of the DJ booth when Nazira was playing, and I had loads of room. No one was barging me. I was perfectly fine to dance there. I had loads of room to dance around. It was perfectly fine. It was awesome. I fucking loved it, right? But I also remember thinking, wow, I remember when I was here. This is probably a bad example because, you know, it's fucking DJ Harvey. But when I saw DJ Harvey playing that main Bergheim space, you couldn't get past the the speakers are hanging like to the right hand side next to the where the bar is you couldn't get past that line it was that full you just, i just had to stand right at the back where the kind of box plinths are next to in front of the kind of rail gates i couldn't get further than that it was just too packed to do it you know sometimes when you're in a club space and you just can't get through because it's just too full i just couldn't do it and this time around it was a lot more emptier and i'm not sure if it was because of the coronavirus people didn't want to travel they didn't want to be in a, didn't want to be in a place where you know, especially in an airport, mostly, you know, you're, you're breathing in everyone's fucking oxygen. You're in a sort of quote unquote controlled environment. Um, but yeah, I did, I did notice one of the biggest clubs in the world, you know, was a lot more empty than it was previously. That could be a thing. It continues here. Uh, Plus, uh, many touring DJs um, have one or two big festival shows that pay and tie on smaller gigs as part of that. With bigger festivals are likely uh, first things to cancel. A lot of smaller promoters may be cancelling cancellations of their bookings, which is very true, which might lead to a lot of people kind of losing out on a lot of money in the back of this. I spoke with a busy mainstream DJ friend yesterday and their opinion was from April onwards, they expect their bookings to only be 50-50. Jesus Christ. I'm watching the news carefully and kind of expecting to to myself. He says the thing is, uh, he says he can't afford to not be gigging and I have a lot of money already outlaid. But perspective, a lot of industries will suffer. Tourism to sport, conferences to catering, which is very true. You already think it was sport. I think Serie A has already postponed a few games. If it kind of kicks off in the UK, they're going to postpone it straight away. We, we don't play when it comes to that sort of stuff. 
despite what someone like Boris Johnson is saying. And um, yeah, and tourism again will suffer too greatly. I, I'm not sure how Asia is going to kind of recover as well. That's the one part of the country or the, of the world, or the region of the world I'm sort of like really have a lot of sympathy for. Once this does get rectified, once the vaccine is found, once people are starting to get a lot more better and they start to understand what's happening, how is how soon do you think people are going to be comfortable to go back to Asia again? really think about it because it's a it's already one of those kind of places that you have to really be into traveling to go to right it's not like you're going to fucking florence or something to go to southeast asia to go to like the philippines vietnam south korea thailand japan china right these aren't places that you'd go to just on a whim there are places that you go to like because you have a, an absolute deep um love appreciation for that part of the world you want to experience the food the culture the religion just the society how it is in general you just want to see it with your own eyes so i'll imagine this sort of thing would really scare people the fact that it's originated from that part of china it would really put people off to going in the first place and i just don't know how they're going to recover from it man that's the one thing i'm really kind of nervous about them for that respects um it continues here it does make me sad though he said that a lot of small independent outfits will be the ones that who who can't ride this out and will be the one other side with just the rich kid promoters still as andrew rice initial tweet points out time to book your look act is very true of course this is always the case though isn't it the people with the most money people with the most means could probably cush everyone's still good like you see with fly b recently right the um regional um airline thing that we have here in the uk they've unfortunately gone bankrupt to go into administration it doesn't matter how much money you got if you don't operate a business in a good sustainable uh way you are also going to suffer the wrath you know of the fact that you might go into administration and you know be out of a job too so that isn't something to really get that wrangled about people are always gonna people with the money are always gonna have most more cushion but in the end um the 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 scene is really plumped up. It's really kind of put on the pedestal. It's really supported by the smaller DJs, the smaller promoters, the smaller festival um, organizers, event bookers. They're the ones that really kind of sustain the, the platform because they allow the promoters for the bigger festivals to see what's bubbling. Because if I keep booking this amazing local girl that's really smashing it and I get her some more gigs, I'm, I eventually get her to play the cause and some guy who manages some big festival and has got all the money, sees her playing then he books her. That's a win for me too because I allowed her the platform to do it she obviously with her talent smashed it which allowed her to then get seen by other people and then essentially it's a kind of cyclical thing so i don't think it's a bad thing i don't think underground artists should stay underground forever i don't i don't think underground promotion should be underground forever either but i think they do service the industry and like they allow people to kind of enter into the in you kind of enter the scene one way because i think it works the other way around too i think some people go to big edm glitzy firework festivals um, see them for what it is think it's a bit naff and then try and look for something a little bit more uh, underground something a little bit more real right so something with a little bit more of a community towards it uh, something with a bit more of a scene and then they kind of find these kind of smaller festivals so they wouldn't have found they would some some people would have never found a Houghton unless they went to like a Tomorrowland right that's how they would have found Houghton because they went to Tomorrowland like oh this is too much then they got to Houghton like oh wow it's got all the elements I like about Tomorrowland but in a very smaller intimate uh, kind of personable way and I'm you know and I, I can build a community community around that i can find love in my life find friends for life that's all kind of a thing that happens as a content conservative so i don't think there is any kind of reason to kind of point oh the rich kids are going to be better off it's like eh, whatever who cares about them do you know what i mean continues here um a major factor is the music scene doesn't or doesn't have the ability to deal with lawsuits or put safely measures into effect uh like football stadiums or disneyland despite clubland being way down the list of actual risky environments i expect it'll be one of the first to suffer which is definitely true and hopefully again but again hopefully it doesn't it doesn't get as bad as it is i, I think the good thing is that because a lot of the festivals happening in the beginning uh maybe some of the festivals are the, i won't say the most popular but i guess if you're a bigger dj some of the some of your kind of more better paying gigs are going to come later down the year so as post human said he did if i mentioned to him from april onwards he's kind of thinking it's going to be 50 50 free in terms of gigs so i assume some of the bigger festivals that you'd play are happening maybe towards april onwards or towards may onwards so there is a thinking that they could be a rectif they could rectify the coronavirus by that time or they could have a way of kind of cont containing it up until that time i think i remember someone saying that the earliest possible time to probably find a cure is um to 2021 right next year uh, early jan jan next year so who knows man the landscape might change really quickly by that time uh, there might be a, a way to contain it but again i think for the most part the reason that they are probably is really worried is that isn't you know the fact they're going to contain it it's the fact that this virus has probably done a lot more in terms of scare tactics for the public than it has done in terms of actually impacting people's pockets so 
I mean, sorry, I'm impacting the actual festivals to get cancelled. So let's get taxes will lease into festivals, and you know, no one wants to travel halfway across the road to go play a festival where there's no one there. Even if you do, even if you're getting paid, you know what I mean, like I think most of you just can agree. But I think I'm even at my local bar DJ level, I know you know how hard it is to play and to kind of entertain yourself when there's no one in front of you dancing or having a good time. So imagine how much more if you're like a successful DJ playing somewhere and you've got literally no one looking up at you. You're just looking up at, you know, at people that work at a festival, you know, tidying up and shit. That could be annoying. But yeah, um, hopefully it gets sorted out very, very soon. Let's move on. Um, should we talk about the coronavirus hate crimes? That's a really crazy thing, isn't it? Like there's a mad video actually here. Of people getting beaten up because they got coronavirus. I made a compilation of it, which I'm not really sure if this is real or not. But quickly play a bit of it now. I think you get demonetized video when you talk about coronavirus. I'm a smaller channel. Um, there's somebody here kind of hitting yo, 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 Now again, I'm not too sure. These videos are always kind of misleading because you don't know. It's like that video of that truck in the middle of somewhere in a city, somewhere in China, where they're kind of spraying all the buildings with antiseptic and shit. I think someone told me that was a video from some another time. It's not really something that's happened now. People are just splicing it together, making it look like happening nowadays. So I'm not sure if that's true or not. So these videos take it a pinch of salt, but it's quite scary to see how um, how everyone's descending into madness, isn't it? Tell him to move. Why does he have to move? Because he's standing right fucking next to me. I don't want him under me. People are going Tell crazy. I don't know what's more offensive. Or well, not more offensive. It's a precautionary measure. And I think that's that's a weird thing we're getting with. Where people are getting offended that people are going out into the world wearing like full blown, you know, um uh hazmat suits and, you know, proper industrial grade face masks and shit. Um or the stuff that you see someone wearing at a power plant in Chernobyl back in the day, right? But, you know, self-preservation isn't it and also i think the idea that because there's some people out there who are just taking it so that's so laissez-faire with the whole coronavirus thing they think it's no big deal which i don't really understand either so maybe this is probably an adequate reaction to it right it's an adequate opposite reaction to people who are like oh it doesn't matter like not all chinese people are got coronavirus I'll, i'm still gonna go eat my local chinese and support them and then there's other people on the other side who are like nah they take they you know it's the kind of person that if you cough they're gonna move on the other side of the train or get off the train and walk somewhere do you know what i mean so, so, so I guess it is what it is. Move. This black move. guy here is getting really aggressive, but an Asian dude looks like on a train, looks like it's New York. I hear about the accent. What are you gonna do? He's gonna hit him. What are you gonna do? He stands back. What are you gonna do? He tells him to move. He's not moving. What are you gonna do to him? Nothing. Move. Oh, was he spraying something? Why is that? Why is that? Why can't I sit next to you? Why can't I sit next to you? What is praying? Yeah, he's praying him an antiseptic or something. It's so fucking bizarre, man. <laughs> and, just and just imagine the roles being reversed. Just imagine there was some sort of virus that affected black people, or that affected, or that started off in a country that was a majority black people, and this is what happened. Just imagine the outrage. Just imagine, man. It's like. <sighs> Sometimes man, the lack of humanity and sympathy people have with people just shocking. Someone's pushing an Asian person, punching random one in the street. For no reason. Some passenger comes and hits him. Some passenger comes and hits him. For no reason. Some passenger comes and hits him. Some passenger comes and hits him. Some passenger comes and hits him. That's good. What am I calling? I saw that she was bleeding as soon as I came. Bloody hell. I'm an absolute coward. What absolute dickhead of a man. Look, old people just punch him in the head. Crazy. Go get help. There's help out here. People act like it's not help. They don't want the help. Exactly. I've been homeless a long time, and I don't beg and ask for nothing. Yeah. I make a way every day for myself. Exactly. Top man. There's more stuff happening here. Another kid getting trampled, I think, somewhere. I don't know why they're doing this. But, uh, again, it's just a... Uh, just, just a real representation of humanity in general, right? People are subject to so, so, loads of this. Uh oh, he's scared, OG. Crack your shit. What's he doing? Walking up to an Asian dude. You hear that, bags. nigga? Get your fucking ass. There's a black guy here with a stick. Is it a stick or a shovel? What's he got in his hand? I'm not sure if it's a stick or a shovel. He's been egged on by the crowd. Pointing at him, looks away. Of course, he wants to hit the Of course, it is. Go get your fucking kid. Jesus Christ. Still hitting him with a bat with a stick. Another one too. They're on the train now, arguing. Yo, uh, yo, yo, go sh oh, shut up. Make me, the black woman says here. Come on, make me. One one by one, make me. Kiss my ass. <laughs> make me. Go back to your company, all that communism. <laughs> go back to your... 
<laughs> Only in America can you tell someone to go back to their country and they can legit and you can you can say that with a straight face, isn't it? When you're an immigrant, because I guess it's a country full of immigrants. No one's really got a claim to a land unless you're a Native American, which you know we know how that story ended. It's mad you can say that, and you can't really say that in the UK. People just laugh at you, right? If you're a black person, you told someone else to go back to their country. Like, what? <laughs> You're an American now. What does that even mean? <laughs> the Asian guys been really good. We eat dogs as well. I think this this is a funny video. I think he, I think this is a comedy thing, right? Pouring water on him. Is this a comedy thing? And the guy chases him forever. He's really fast as well. He runs after him quickly. And then he grabs him and they just keep giving over. But yeah. Someone will cover their mouth. There's an Asian person who will sit and sit next to her. But yeah, man, crazy shit, man, crazy shit. Let's move on, man. This current stuff is boring anyway. Let's move on. Um, so, another story here about Nicki Minaj, right? This is one something I'm very interested in talking about just for, on a slightly base. Um, I don't know, man. It's strange, isn't it? I guess because this is a story that's broken over the last couple of 24 hours. Supposedly, Nicki Minaj's husband-to-be or husband, I'm not sure if they are legitimately married. This is your husband from TMZ. He has supposedly been arrested by the feds for not registering as a sex offender. So I think that was part of the reason why people were kind of ragging on her the first place when she got up, when she hooked up with this dude. I think it was well known that he had these prior charges when he was younger. He was kind of arrested for some sort of, you know, sexual misconduct act or something that had to do with um, having such an underage person. I'm not sure what the details of it are. But regardless, he got, she got always a bad rap behind it. So I think so part of the story is that Nicki Minaj is like just not the kind of... Um, <laughs> She's suffering from that. No, is it the Lena Dunham thing? Yeah, the Lena Dunham thing is probably a good idea. Presentation of it, right? Lena Dunham on at one in one at one period of time. I think before the whole like, let's support women screenwriters, directors, producers. She was maybe the one of the first. And it's also really young, super talented, right? She was right, direct, uh, star in Girls at the time. But then I guess the as soon as other people started to come into the fold and other. Um, creatives, maybe other stars started to come get introduced by Hollywood and Hollywood was giving them more, you know, Hollywood is fucking awful, you know, they don't really give a shit about anything unless it makes some money. So whenever they, when, when they saw that there was a real demand and real thirst for these kind of women-led, women-centric dramas and TV programs and movies, they started to give a lot more women chances, which is great for the women in general anyway. But for Lena Dunham, what it did is that it, it made her, it, it kind of made people compare her to other people within the scene. Maybe people are less problematic. And people started to see that ah, oh, she's actually a shitty human being. I think she's always she was always a bit of a divisive character anyway, Lena Dunham. But I think the moment you start to the moment you put her next to an Issa Rae and they start talking, you can it's quite quick. You can you can it's quite easy to pick who you'd prefer to like hang out with, right? Or who you'd prefer to your daughter to have like as someone to look up to. So I think the same thing happened to Nicki Minaj, where like she was on her own for so long, smashing it. There was no one that came close to her. That she didn't have any peers in that respect, in the kind of level of success that she had, especially in a, as a rap, as a female rap hip hop star at that time. But in the moment you introduce other people into the scene, the moment Cardi B comes around, the moment all them, all the kind of um, I don't know, all those other girls come up, you know, the ones that have the, the Asian dolls and all, you know, the girls that come up from her loving hip hop and and the girls from the Black Ink crew come up. It kind of makes her look a bit more shitty because she's not, you know, the most, you know, warmest person. A bit more, she's quite competitive, quite argumentative, you know, whatever it may be. She's got that personality that people wouldn't like, but I think it made it worse. I think because of that, everything that she touches just kind of treated upon with scorn. People kind of go out of their way to kind of really pile on her, and I guess it's part of the story because we know this already about the husband. Why is it being? It feels as if like they're trying to crank up against people that don't really know, so they can bring more attention to it. So that what it can eventually drive her to divorce him. I don't know what the story is here. I guess maybe when you can when it's in in isolation, it's not so bad. Maybe if you look at it in totality, the fact that her brother got convicted of rape or something or something sexual too in that regard, that might make you look worse. But again, she can't. Um, if your brother ends up being a serial killer, does that kind of paint you in a bad light too? I don't think that's fair. Right, she can't necessarily be judged by the actions of her brother, even though they are blood. It doesn't matter; they're two different people. And I think this is a similar sort of thing too. Like he got caught up in, a, I guess, a kind of an oversight on his part, and now he's in trouble again with the police. So it's a story from the TMZ. This is the following: the TMZ or TMZ. Uh, Nicki Minaj's husband arrested by the feds for not reaching as a sex offender. Right. It says the following here. Um, so uh, Petty just um, appeared in court and plead. Okay, that's his, his actual name is Petty. I didn't know that. Um, so I, I thought she was just saying Petty because she's Petty. But I guess it's because she's, you know, it's that double entendre. Anyway, um, let's read the original story here, right? 
Uh, Nikon's husband passed is coming back to bite him in the ass. He's been arrested by the US Marshals on an incident following uh, for failing to register as a sex offender, TMZ has learned. TMZ has learned. Now, who's selling TMZ these stories too? It's so awful, isn't it? Like, oh, God almighty. Imagine dealing with this thing as a couple and then it's being plastered all over the media. Again, I know Nikon is a big personality and she's going to have her stuff put out there, but I don't know, man. Something about it is rubbing up the wrong way. How they have all this information about stuff that's happening, you know, and people's families and shit. And it's, 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 it's more disturbing when they probably are informing the family members of something happening before she's even having a chance to tell them themselves. Now, again, that's what happens at the internet, but, you know, it's just still not the best thing to do. So, um, here, Kenneth Petty was in federal custody Wednesday, we're told when he turned himself into the marshals. According to court documents, he'll face a judge later today. Petty moved to California in July 2019, but according to law enforcement, he got pulled over in Beverly Hills in November, and that's when his legal trouble started. We're told Beverly Hills PD made a traffic stop on November 15th, right, recently, determined Petty was a registered sex offender in New York state, but had not registered in California as required. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, around his place, asked for his details. He was arrested and released on a $20,000 bond. The LA County DA charged him for failing to register sex offender in, in, in California too. It appears he didn't check in after uh, that because he now feds are in on his case. Okay, so after, so it's his own fault basically. He didn't go back and register a sex offender. He was indicted in federal court for the same thing, failing to register. Um, as we reported, Kenneth's rap sheet it includes a 1995 conviction for first degree attempted rape. Bloody hell, that's a mad one. Where did she find this guy, Nikki, as well? In terms of, I don't know, you know, you can't help who you fall in love with, but in terms of all the kind of public backlash that she's received over the years and her sentiment in the media not being the best and with people, because we've seen this story happen before. We've seen people, you know, I look at the kind of Camilla Cabello and that kind of guy that she's dating at the moment. They always, you know, they always spotted somewhere it's kind of swapping saliva and holding hands all the time. You, can't, you, you do get a feeling it was either happy coincidence or there are some, you know, something at work behind the scenes is kind of put place in these very attractive young people together. So they can kind of boost their profile, you know, extend their career a bit more, add a bit more of a different narrative towards it. Because you saw it happening a lot with Jeezy and Halsey. He'd always bring around Kiss on stage, Nicki Minaj and Mick. There's this weird thing that happens with celebrities when they get into a couple where it then turns into another sort of revenue stream, another content kind of um, uh, platform or, or output that you can kind of lead into. Um, but I wonder where she found this dude. Like, where did she find him? Like, of all the people to kind of hook up with, this is the one you choose? Like... There's just so much baggage that comes with him, I guess, which is just, um, you know. But again, I guess it goes to show her character too, that she's been right or die with him. This, pen, the, the, you know, aside from everything that's happened, she's still stuck by his side. So that goes to show that she's an actual loyal person when it comes to people that she actually loves. Um, first degree attempted rape back in the day. He served almost four years.
is you should be doing that. I'm I'm signed to independent labels. I'm not signed to them big ass labels these other artists are signed to, and they got pushes and they get placements and they do all kind of shit. So anything you see me do is because I woke up and did it that day. It's not nothing that nobody. Come, came put in my hand. I work for everything that I do. I really be working. And to try to stop me from working is really crazy. All I want to do is make music. All I want to do is put out music. So... When that money get involved, that shit just really go left all the time. So to... To new artists coming out, I just want to say, please, it might seem good, it might sound good, but you definitely got to read.
and you gotta read and read, read, read all that shit. Don't sign nothing without no real lawyer, and make sure your lawyers is not the lawyers of your label lawyers. Get your own lawyer with their own opinion. Read that motherfucking paperwork and have somebody that know what they talking about reading. So, me fucked up. I'm music and you know that you're really doing right. Damn it. My check one too. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, it's still working. Okay, cool. So um sorry, the, the lily fell out of my microphone. So um Rock Nation signed there, they did that whole big lavish thing where they gave her rose on top of some skyscraper somewhere in the middle of New York overlooking Manhattan or something. Really epic shit. Rock Nation know what they're doing, right? So I think Rock Nation too need to take some ownership. Have they got a label? Or is it just a production management team? Why didn't they have their own label? Why are they why are they putting ma- artists in this position where or maybe they have a relationship with atlantic in it right it's an atlantic partnership where if you sign with rock nation you get uh right is it an atlantic thing i'm not sure what it is but it's just a bit it's a bit um scummy that they'll do is why wouldn't they directly talk to this carl crawford and just get the deal done if they want to if they want like co-partner and have it on the same i don't know so um everybody in the industry knows this is what jay-z and rock nation do they come in find the smallest thing wrong with the problem um because there, there weren't any problems before she left 
And then she says that she, I didn't want to negotiate. Okay, tell everybody your definition of negotiating. Your definition is okay. I'm going to send Suge Knight's old lawyers to come in and it's a stick up. Of course, I'm like, this isn't a negotiation, it's a robbery. They want to make it look like I'm greedy. No, they're trying to keep me out of everything. She keeps saying, them niggas over there are negotiating my contract. Them ends over there are sitting there right next to her. T. Ferris is the one. Her mum did the contract. I'm new to business. I let this guy, T. Ferris, run my whole business because I knew and absolutely nothing about it. Zero. So he wrote the contract up. I didn't do it. A little bit bad there throwing his man of the bus back and understand it. They want to make a big deal about it. We sign a deal, honor your contract, and let's just keep doing business. How we've been doing it, everything is fine. Nobody's trying to rob you. When Megan announced um, her management deal with Rock Nation, from my understanding, you found out the news the same time as everyone else, correct? Oh my god. <laughs> this is awful. So he found out on Instagram too. When it got put up on Shade Room or something. The guy T Ferris, the one who was helping me with business, he was handling Megan for me. She's a girl. So he was used to being a road manager. I was letting him handle the business. And he said, we're going to Rock Nation. We've got a meeting. And I said, oh, cool. We're going we're gonna to go meet and meet Jay-Z? I'm actually excited because I got to meet Jay-Z. My, I got to meet Jay-Z myself, you know? He looks up to this man. And he said, I said, what's going on? He said, um, no big deal. We're just finna show up, show us around the building. Little small shit. <laughs> Whenever someone says something like that about a big meeting with somebody with a legend like Jay-Z at Rock Nation, right? A staple in the industry. You know it's absolute BS, right? We're just going to go see the building. Come on, really? Um, now, you know, it's nothing serious. Well, cool. So I didn't go because we were just uh, on tour with her. Me and her, me and Megan are perfectly fine at this moment. Next thing you know, I'm on a plane. And I'm thinking the whole industry is going to try and take Megan from me. Not my homeboy. So he's, he's worried already, but he's not thinking his dude's going to do it. So I go and link up with Jay Prince. Next thing you know, the picture is posted up on the internet of him saying, you know, people are not loyal and shit, which is a bit of a bad move. And someone says, the comments is like, oh, you're bitter. No, I was already posting Jay Prince before when I found out like everybody else. I got emotional and made one comment, which is, you know, you shouldn't have done, but hey, they took that and ran with it. Like, oh, he's bitter. He's mad. Look, I'm just trying to see what's up. I thought they had enough respect for me to at least tell me something. But it's cool. She don't have to tell me about that. That's fine. But at the end of the day, Tell me, tell them that their plan, that their plan was. Tell, tell them what their real plan was. Their real plan was to get you out of my contract so they can give signing to Rock Nation. That's all they want. We gave this girl sixty forty split. Now go ask the artist about that. She got parts of her masters the first time. You think Jay Z would have gave her part of her masters for the first record deal of Rock Nation? Fuck no. Then she gets ten hundred thousand dollars advance. A uh, show, sorry. She don't. She she don't want to pay up. So the problem is, I think, with the 360 deal is that they get a part of everything. They get a 60-40 split of her record sales, her merch, and her shows. So if she gets paid 100000 they have to get they have to see 40% of that too. Which, I think he's arguing that in most record deals, the 60-40 split is actually the other way around. It actually goes more to a label and then less to the artist. But this time around, they gave her 60% and the record label gets 40. It's still a crazy amount. I don't know why anyone will sign a 360 deal. I think the reason why people sign 360 deals, I think primarily is that because you usually get a quite a big cash advance for the fact that they're going to take more out of you along the way because you could end up being you know for every for every uh kid caddy there's a charles hamilton right you could just disappear into the reefer and it could also be the next big global superstar so in your in your understanding if you're kid caddy it doesn't matter if you're a 360 deal because you just keep making money it might not be as much as you would do if you had your the majority of the splits or if you had you know ownership of stuff it might not be as much as it could be but because you just keep generating income, it doesn't really necessarily matter. But it does get a little bit tricky when you're at that kind of cusp like Megan Thee Stallion and you're trying to cross over and really make it and blow. And the money that you're making for the work you're putting in just isn't what it should be. It just feels a bit flat. I get why the frustration is there. Anyway, then she gets a $100,000 show and she doesn't want to pay up. That's what the issue was about. She signed with Rock Nation in August and decided she didn't want to pay no more. And I think Joe Budden mentioned in his podcast that supposedly Rock Nation has a deal with Live Nation. So she probably gets booked shows via Rock Nation that makes sure that she doesn't give them... So she gets paid directly through Live Nation, doesn't, doesn't need to pay a record label. Rock Nation probably takes like a 10, 20% cut from her check, which is far less than what her record label is doing. She sees a lot more money. The people at Rock Nation are a lot nicer to her. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess I, I can see why she got a little bit like dizzy with the whole rock major thing. Jay Z talking about her like, business. She's meeting Beyonce. I get what's happening here. Uh, they're using that same strong arm tactic so that I can renegotiate the contract. They're holding the money and they haven't paid me since August. Jesus, she done over fifteen shows. Y'all do the math. She gets hundred thousand dollars a show. She owes me and I haven't rec recouped almost two million. What 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 we spent on her building her up so that Rock Nation would want to come around, which is very annoying too. I guess for an independent label, if you're the one 
building up the artist and then the rock nation comes with all their glitzy you know um cosigns and their nice offices and their rooftop toasting and dj khaled and all this amazing shit and beyonce popping in and saying hi it's like um um, where was Rock Nation when uh, when we was grinding and riding around and in back streets? Rock Nation was nowhere to be found. Soon as we spent our money, blow it up, uh, all, all of a sudden these strangers, uh, people just met. They introduced you to Beyonce and now you, we the devil? We, we were just the angels sent from the sky. Now we're the devil just because Jay-Z saved you. You're so fake. Again, it's a very messy topic. Much more the interview there to talk about. Uh, you can read it yourself. I'll link it in the show if you guys to check it out. But again, the truth lies somewhere in the middle here with Crawford uh, v. Megan Thee Stallion. Again, I think it's a it's a it's a cautionary tale for most up and coming artists. Please do not sign a deal until you have the means to, or bootstrap yourself until you get to a point where you can renegotiate. Because at the end of the day. You give yourself more bargaining power to negotiate a better deal if you have something more to back up with it. If you have the numbers to back up, the numbers of shows, the fans, the streams, whatever it may be. So there's no need to spend, there's no need to take the money from the record label up front now whilst you're still coming up because it's going to bite you in the ass later on down the line as it has done Megan Thee Stallion. She could have easily, if she wanted to bootstrap, done it herself. Not easily, but she could have done it herself. But she took the easy option out to kind of quicken the journey for her to become a star, which I understand because if you're struggling and doing open mics and shitty bars and pubs, you want to make it as soon as possible. I know even with my DJing, right? I much prefer to kind of make it and become a touring uh, club hopping DJ sooner rather than later. But I also know that the, the longer the slog is now at the beginning, the more longevity I have towards the end and the more opportunity I have to negotiate higher and higher rates for myself and be a bit more picky about where I play later on towards the line. But in the short term, I'm going to suffer because I don't have the automatic cosign or the ability to go and just play wherever because I don't have the funds to do that. Do you know what I mean? So that's the kind of sacrifice you have to be made. But I just think nowadays in 2020, there's literally no excuse for an artist to be um, hoodwinked into signing a deal like this. Even though it's not hoodwinked, even though it's a kind of a pretty um, standard record industry deal, it sounds like I don't think you should ever be in a position where you have to be at the behest or at the kind of beck and call of a label you know requesting they get money from all your stuff your merch your shows your stream it's insane you don't need to do that you could easily do that on your own and then once it gets a level where you need to kind of boost up you can then kind of sign an exclusive one album two album deal with a record label and just shop yourself around and pick up checks as you go along right you you would imagine you you bootstrap yourself in the beginning you do all on your own you work a job you put your money into your artistry you blow up you negotiate a record label you sign a one album deal a two album deal you get a good advance in the beginning of it. You know how to make that money work. You know how to make money work anyway. You don't have a lot. So if someone gives you a big cash advance, you can easily make that work for you seven, ten times fold, right? And then you do that two albums and you shop yourself around again. You just keep bouncing around from, especially with the streaming platforms out there, which are effectively record labels anyway. You could be making so much money hand over fist, even without shows. So imagine you're giving up your shows, which is a big part of your income. And you're giving a part of your streams. It's just a really insane story to in the beginning. Um, but again, hopefully it sheds more light on it because Megan Stallion is a popular person. People will obviously see, oh, wow, if Megan Thee Stallion is a shitty deal, imagine my deal. So hopefully that is something of a cautionary tale going forward. Anyway, that's the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Excellent Zinger Show episode number 287. Um, as I mentioned previously, this is more so the general topics one. The Street Podcast will come on the show after this, so keep an eye out for that. Until then, if you're listening via the podcast app, please like, please share, leave me a five-star review. If you're watching via YouTube, smash that like button, leave a comment down below, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care, be safe, and peace!